Yeah. Hi, everybody, to come in this uh, special Sunday afternoon edition of Wednesday Night at the Lab here on February 2023. Uh, if you'd like to come to Wednesday Night at the Lab on February 8th, John Fox from Anthropology will be here for a special Darwin Days presentation. We'll be speaking on finding other ancient minds across the human evolutionary tree. It's a Wednesday night at the lab is every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. The following Wednesday on February 15th, Francisco Pellegrini from the Department of Genetics here will talk about preserving biodiversity. And then on February 22nd, Dietram Schuftler from the uh, Department of Life Science Communication will be talking about science communication in the era and after the era of COVID. Um, and so now I'm going to invite Will Vike to say a few words on behalf of the Friends of the Lakeshore Nature Preserve, uh, who, which is the organization that is sponsoring this today. Thank you, Tom. Uh, hello, my name is Will Vike. I'm the president of the Friends of the Lake Nature Preserve, and uh, we are super excited to be working with Wednesday Night at the Lab to bring Ben and Please pronounce your last name for me. Juliano. Juliano here to speak with us about wasps. And uh, the mission of the Friends of the Lake Nature Preserve, which uh, we're a nonprofit organization, is to inspire people to connect and care for the Lake Nature Preserve. And uh, I can't think of a better way to inspire people to go out into the preserve by hearing about all the amazing buzzing uh, bees and wasps we have out there as well and, and their role in the ecosystem. So uh, without further ado, I will pass the microphone on to, to Tom. To also introduce you. Good. Thank you very much, Will. And then, Ben, if you want to come up here. Yes. Uh, I get to ask you the five questions. Ben, where were you born? I was born in Concord, Massachusetts. And where'd you go to high school? I went to high school at uh, Bishop Girton High School in Nashua, New Hampshire. Nashua? Yeah. And where'd you go to undergrad, and what did you study? I went to undergrad at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and I studied ecology, evolution, and biodiversity. Great. Yeah. And then um, did you come here for your master's and PhD? I did. Yeah, I came here in 2018. And what are you getting your degrees in? My degree, so I have a master's degree in agroecology, um, and I'm getting my PhD in integrative biology. Great. And so that's a separate department from the Department of Entomology, but your major professor? Correct. Yeah. Claudio Gratton, my major professor, is in entomology. Great. Um, so and to... all my research is about insects. Great. I was trying to give credit to both departments. So, yeah. So I hope I got that right. Tonight, you're going to talk with, or this afternoon, you're going to speak with us about predator insects and wasps, their role and benefits. Uh, would you please join me in welcoming Ben Giuliano to Wednesday Night Lab? Thanks, Tom. All right. Thank you for having me. I'll pull up the slides. All right. So yes, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Will. It's great to be here. Um, flattered by the invitation and excited to share some information about a group of insects that have uh, been capturing my imagination for the past year, year and a half or so. My research is not about wasps. I actually study lady beetles, which is another important group of insects. And I'm happy to answer questions about that um, when it comes to question time too. But for today, uh, we're going to talk all about wasps. Um, and I wanted to start maybe just by some informal polling or surveying of you all. What are some words that come to mind when you think about wasps or feelings? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Stinger, yeah. Pain. Pain. Yeah, nests. Control, yeah. Yeah. We're actually going to get to that pretty soon. So stay tuned. Um, yeah, I think that was a good sort of captures a lot of the, the attitudes people have. There tends to be a lot of association with the stinging and um, fear. Maybe they're a nuisance because they're building their nests where you don't want them to be. But we also know maybe there's some good things that they do. But I think in general, those are sort of downplayed compared to the negatives. Um, and I think this is definitely true if you do sort of a, a quick Google. If you look about at memes about wasps and bees, you get stuff like this. Uh, so we have a, a honeybee here on uh, the left. Um, and a wasp 
um, as well. And we have these positive things about the honeybee. They're caring. They want you to breathe. They're a pollination station. They take care of your dog while you're away. The wasp is rude. It pollinates nothing. It stings for fun. It ruins picnics. Um, you can find a variety of types of things like these. This wasp apparently is mean and ugly, literally has no purpose. Just another example. This one concludes that the wasp is just an asshole. Uh, so I'm here to uh, sort of correct this narrative a bit today. And I want to start by talking about this study that came out in 2018 by this researcher, Syrian Sumner, and her group at the University of College in London. Um, she is a wasp biologist. Um, and over the course of the first part of her career sort of was realizing, wow, these organisms are so cool and I study them for a living, but nobody really cares about them, um, especially in comparison to bees. So they published this paper called Why We Love Bees and Hate Wasps. Um, and in it, they surveyed almost 800 members of the public uh, from all over the world, mostly concentrated in the UK where their lab is concentrated. And they wanted to sort of quantify this attitude that people have towards bees versus wasps. And they also included some questions about butterflies and flies in their survey as well, because they didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to uh, bias the direction of their results by setting up this dichotomy between bees and wasps. So first they just asked people to use words to describe these groups like I just did with you. Um, and they came up with this word cloud of the most common words that people use to describe the different groups. And on the top left corner, uh, we have wasps and those sting is the word that stands out as the most common uh, thing that people associate. You also see annoying, scary, buzz, yellow, or some other words that stand out. With bees, honey was the main word that people used, which is interesting because honeybees are just one or maybe a couple species of bee depending where you are in the world. Um, there's so many other bees besides that, but that's for another talk. Um, flowers, pollination, they also know that bees sting, but generally more positive words. Flies were annoying and dirty and they have wings and they buzz. Butterflies were almost universally adored with their pretty wings, beautiful, colorful flowers, etc. They also um, asked people to like quantify this attitude basically on a scale from negative five to five negative five being I hate this organism and five being I love this organism. And they found differences in all of these groups. Butterflies were by far the most popular, followed by bees, then flies, and then wasps in last place. Um, they also asked people about their interest in nature, figuring, hey, maybe people that are more interested in nature will actually appreciate wasps. Uh, but interestingly, they found that as so now we have a graph that's got interest in nature on the x axis and then that same emotional value on the y and there are going to be different lines for the different types of insects. And they actually found that the more interested people were in nature, there was more polarization in their attitude. So the people that weren't that interested in nature maybe didn't distinguish very strongly between these different groups. But the people that were very interested in nature had very high positive emotional value for bees and butterflies and still slightly negative emotional value on average for wasps and flies. So I uh, am going to, like I said, correct this bad reputation that wasps have today by walking through these sort of three questions. First, I'm going to talk for a little while about what a wasp is, going through their evolutionary history and taxonomy, which hopefully can be helpful for you as you're outdoors, as things start to warm up in the spring and summer to identify some of these types of wasps that you may see in your garden or in the Lakeshore Nature Preserve. Um, then I'm going to talk about why we should care about wasps, and I'll go into some of their behavior, ecology, and the ecosystem services that they provide. And then lastly, a little bit about how we can protect wasps and talk about their conservation and management of the landscape to promote their health. Okay, first I'm going to start with what even is a wasp? Does anybody think they have a good working definition of a wasp that they'd be willing to share? Yeah. Ants with wings. Yeah. Not a bad definition. Arguably, ants that have wings are also ants with wings. And bees are also arguably sort of like ants with wings. Um, so we need something to distinguish them. Narrow-waisted. Narrow yeah. That's an important defining characteristic in the evolution of wasps, which I'm going to talk about. 
four wings. Yeah. So all in this group, all many insects have four wings um, and wasps and bees and uh, ants are no exception. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about wasps through evolutionary time. And so to do that, I want to first orient you to this type of figure, a phylogenetic tree. You may have seen this before. Maybe it's been a while if you have to think back to your biology classes. Um, but basically moving from left to right here, we're moving forward in time. And then the different letters are different species. Uh, the breakage points, we call those nodes, are points of the most recent common ancestor of the species that are on the right end of the figure. Um, and so like this point is the most recent common ancestor of all of the species in the tree. And then this point would be the most recent common ancestor of just those two species, A and B. This is a phylogeny of the Hymenoptera, which is the grouping of insects that includes wasps, bees, and ants. There's a lot of information on this figure. I don't expect you to take all of it in right now, but I'm going to use it to sort of help walk through some of these key defining characteristics and when and why they evolved. So we're going to start um, in the Permian period with uh, the oldest extant type of insect in this group are the sawflies. I don't know if you may or may not have heard of sawflies. I feel like they're an under uh, talked about insect, but they um, have these larvae that sort of look like caterpillars. All of these insects go through the same metamorphosis process that a butterfly does. So they start as an egg, hatch into a caterpillar, make a cocoon, um, and then grow as an adult. Um, the sawflies, you can sort of see it looks like a wasp. It doesn't have that defining wasp waist that you were talking about. Um, but these will chew on leaves as larvae and then develop into or these sawfly adults. Um, and this, these first evolved over 300 million years ago. So this is like when the earth was Pangaea and like all of the land masses were one big land mass before the tectonic plate split. So a really long time ago. Then we get about 240 million years ago at the beginning of the Triassic period, which is around the time when the dinosaurs were living, um, we get the wasp waste evolution. And so everything hereafter uh, is going to be either a bee wasp or ant. So the sawflies don't have this characteristic. And this grouping together, the wasps, bees, and ants are called the apocrita. The oldest of the apocrita are stingless wasps. Um, and I'm not going to talk a ton about those today, though they are wasps. Um, and a few key points I will. These are just a couple of examples. Here's a calcid wasp and an ichneumon wasp. So they're stingless wasps, so they don't sting. So does anybody know what that long pointy thing sticking out of the ends of the wasps are? Yeah. <laughs> you can both be right. <laughs> yes, it's an ovipositor. Um, and so here's actually a video of an ichneumon wasp that is just finishing laying some eggs. It actually finds its host insects that live burrow into the bark of this tree. And then it sticks its ovipositor into the hole that the host insect burrowed and lays its eggs inside of that insect. So more on this later. But you can see this really remarkable long ovipositor. And it's pulling it out. Um, so these are very strong. Some of them are able to actually drill through wood. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a tube that it, uh, they lay its eggs through. This is a, type, a species of wasp that we actually have in Wisconsin. Um, it's a giant ichneumon wasp. So the stinger didn't evolve until about 190 million years ago at the beginning of the Jurassic period. So this is sort of when the first birds were uh, roaming the planet. Um, and the stinger has actually evolved from the ovipositor to uh, be able to eject poison <laughs> rather than eggs. Um, and in most of the wasps I'm going to be talking about, the stinger is used for that venom um, rather than for laying eggs. That comes in a, a different organ for most groups nowadays. So that was 190 million years ago, the evolution of the stinger. And so that group where the ovipositor has been modified to a stinger is called the aculeata, and that's the stinging wasps, bees, and ants. And I'll be spending more time here um, in a moment. An important thing that happens in this group multiple times is the evolution of what scientists call eusociality. Um, so you think about honeybees, right, that live in a hive. Most bees and other types of flying insects like wasps and ants in this group, Hymenoptera, don't actually have a colony or a hive. They live 
by themselves. Um, but some of them do have this social organization where they have cooperative brood care, overlapping generations, division of labor by reproductive groups. And this evolved independently eight to 11 times in the Hymenoptera. Humans technically are also a eusocial species because we have um, sort of all of these characteristics. So this is the Aculeata, the stinging bees, wasps, and ants. Um, and I just wanted to show you the little bit more zoomed in. We're gonna walk through some of these groups in a minute. Um, the last couple evolutionary time points I wanna point out are the evolution of pollen collection about 11, or sorry, 110 million years ago. Um, and this was in the middle of the Cretaceous period. So this is when the explosion of angiosperms was happening, the flowering plants. So that sort of makes sense, right? There's all this flower, all these flowers around, all this pollen. Um, and the evolution of pollen collection really marks the beginning of bees. Bees are really just vegetarian wasps that have evolved to eat plant matter, pollen for protein rather than animals or other insects. And then uh, the bees, so then are in this group called Anthophila. There's a huge amount of beautiful diversity here. Again, a topic for another talk, um, but my lab studies uh, bees as well. So I'm happy to answer questions about bees if people are interested in that. Um, and then lastly, I want to point out the evolution of ants about 90 million years ago. This is Formicidae, uh, so named for the formic acid that they um, can produce. Um, and all ants are in the same family, Formicidae, whereas like bees and wasps, there's a few different families. In total, there's about 30,000 described species of wasps with many, many more uh, undescribed to science. For example, even just in the stingless wasps, um, scientists estimate there's about 650,000 species. So super diverse. This is the second most diverse group of insects after beetles, um, which is one of the most diverse groups of insects in the world or groups of animals in the world. Okay. Now I'm going to zoom in a little bit more on these stinging wasps, because these are the ones that we typically think about when we think about wasps, and they're also the ones that we typically have the mostly negative associations with. We're going to start with the Vespidae, um, which is a grouping uh, that is contains what we most commonly think about when we think about wasps. So it's the potter wasps, paper wasps, and others. There's three key Vespidae sub subfamilies that I think it's useful to know. So there's the Vespinae, which are the yellow jackets and hornets the Polystinae, which are the paper wasps, and the Eumenonae, which are the potter wasps. And I'm gonna go through each of these and how you can tell them apart a little bit. So first is the hornets. Hornets are technically only those wasps that are in the genus Vespa. There's only one hornet, one or two hornets that can be found in the United States, and there's no native hornets to North America. This is the European hornet, um, which, you may be able to find in Wisconsin. There aren't really many recorded sightings of it, but they're definitely found in Michigan and Illinois. So it wouldn't surprise me if there are a few stray ones around. Hornets are social. Um, they can have as many as 700 workers in a colony. They make paper nests constructed from chewed up wood. Um, like many wasps, they're hunters and sugar feeders. So they'll attack large insects like bees and grasshoppers. Hornets tend to be pretty big. They'll kill them and then, so sting them with their venom and then bring them back to their nests to feed their babies. Uh, which is sort of a recurring theme that's going to come up through these wasps. Um, you may have heard, remembered a couple years ago in 2020 about the murder hornet panic. Um, those are also true hornets, and there were a couple sightings in the West Coast. As of 2022, there weren't any sightings, and they've never made it to Wisconsin. So you're not seeing murder hornets ever. Um, you may see a European hornet. You may have heard of like the bald-faced hornet, which is actually not a true hornet. It's a type of yellow jacket, actually. So yellow jackets are defined as wasps in the families Vespula and Dolico Vespula. Um, this is the Eastern yellow jacket. These are also social. They can have hundreds to thousands per colony. Their nesting strategies are really variable by species. Um, and so, yeah, it can sort of depend whether they're nesting in cavities or making paper nests. They're also hunters and sugar feeders as well, and they consume several different types of pest species, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The paper wasps are the Polystinae subfamily. Um, these are semi-social, so they live in colonies with queens. They don't get, tend to get very large, but they can also have sometimes multiple queens all living in the same shared space. They, as their name says, make paper nests constructed from chewed up wood. And one way you can tell them apart is if they're a male, at least, they have these curly antennae. I don't know if you can sort of see right here. 
they curl up at the ends um, if they're males. And here's two species that are pretty common around here, the European paper wasp, which is not native, but it does exist now in North America and in Wisconsin. Um, and then the Northern paper wasp is a native species. The next group in the Vespidae are the Eumenidae, which are the potter wasps and mason wasps. These are mostly solitary. Some of them have some primitive sociality, but primarily solitary. They are cavity nesters, so they're not making paper nests like the yellow jackets or some of the paper wasps, but they're um, either using pre-construct pre-existing cavities or they make these little pots, which is where they get their name from soil and regurgitated water. Um, an interesting thing about these is um, anthropologists uh, actually think that a lot of Native American pottery is sort of designed and modeled after paper wasp pots. Um, which is a cool instance, I think, of taking inspiration from nature or biomimicry. Um, in each of these little pots, they'll lay one egg and then deposit a single dead insect for that egg to enjoy as a treat when it hatches uh, into its larvae. Next, I'm going to talk about the this group called the Chrysidoidae, which are the cuckoo wasps and allies. Um, you may know, you've heard of like a cuckoo bird. Um, cuckoo is a life strategy that means they're kleptoparasites, so they'll actually lay their eggs in the nests of other species and then let the mother of that species provision for the babies. So it's like the lazy way of <laughs> raising your kids. Um, you have someone else do it for you. So they lay their eggs in the nests of other species. Sometimes those eggs will actually hatch before the primary species, eat the young of that species, and then be raised and fed thereafter by the mother of the, the second species. They're always solitary. Um, they're a little <laughs> gruesome, perhaps, in their life strategy, but I do think they're very beautiful. This is a species that we can find in Wisconsin called uh, Amelis iridescens. Um, but I have to show, this is not a species we can find here. This is a South African species, but it just like doesn't even look real to me. It looks like jewelry or something, right? So. They're really, really beautiful uh, group of wasps. Uh, the next group I want to talk about is the Pompilidae or the spider wasps. Um, you may think they get that name because they sort of look like spiders with those like spindly long legs, but they are actually called that because they are uh, specialized feeders on spiders. So these are all solitary. They hunt spiders to feed their babies. Um, and actually all known all spider families, all, all the different uh, families of spider have at least one known wasp species in this family that's a, a predator, a specialized predator on that spider. Um, they're usually dark colored, like bluish or black with long spiny legs. Um, and yeah, they're pretty strong. They can take down some big, big spiders. Next is the uh, scolioidea, which are the scoliid wasps. These are solitary. Um, they hunt scarab beetle larvae in particular. So those are like Japanese beetles are a scarab beetle. So these are good ones to have around if you don't want Japanese beetles in your garden. Um, they are pretty hairy for a wasp, um, which I don't know if you can see sort of around between the thorax and the abdomen, there's a bunch of bristly hairs, um, which is useful uh, later <laughs> evolutionarily uh, if you think about bees, they're really, really hairy compared to wasps, and that's for the collection of pollen. So you can sort of see these are pretty closely related to bees, um, and you can sort of see those traits starting to emerge. And then lastly is this group, the Apoidea, which this is also the group that bees are in. Um, so these are the thread-waisted wasps or the Spessidae. This is a blue mud dauber. It's a native species. Um, these have very diverse life histories. They hunt for all different types of insects to feed their young. Um, and it includes the sand wasps, mud daubers, and grass carrying wasps. And then the other one I want to talk about in this group, the Apoidea, is the Cabronid wasps, um, which have also diverse life histories, um, hunt various insects. It includes the square headed wasps and digger wasps and cicada killers, which you may have seen. These are the largest wasps that we have in Wisconsin. Um, like their name suggests, they kill cicadas. Um, so they're, they're really large. Um, and I think when in the height of the murder hornet, hornet panic, uh, our resident uh, diagnostic entomologist in the entomology department was getting a lot of false sightings of people seeing this, thinking it was a murder hornet. Okay, 
that's a quick rundown of WASP taxonomy. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about why we should care about these creatures. Um, I've alluded to it a bit, um, but I want to go into more detail with some case studies. And I think the framework that's useful for thinking about this is this idea of ecosystem services, which you may have heard that term before or not. But either way, um, it's a way to think about nature's contributions to people or the benefits that humans derive from our environment. And this can come in a variety of different forms. Classically, they're categorized into these provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supportive services. And it can be anything from soil formation, aesthetic beauty, recreational value, provisioning of wood and food. Um, so all different sorts of things, ways that we benefit from nature. Uh, this, I want to highlight, this is uh, another figure from that study I was talking about at the beginning to understand why people like bees and don't like wasps. And in addition to asking people about just their feelings, they were curious, the authors were curious um, whether people actually knew whether wasps or bees were doing anything for people. So they called that their ecosystem service value. Um, and again, we have interest in nature on the x-axis horizontally, and then we're going to have a line for wasps and a line for bees. And people like over the whole span of interest in nature seem to be pretty confident that bees have high ecosystem service value. They do pollination. But people don't really seem to know about the ecosystem service value of wasps. And I'm here to say that wasps not only do pollination, they do a bunch of other stuff that bees do not do. And so I think it's uh, time that we give them attention for those services. This was a really nice paper that came out um, like just over a year and a half ago now from the same research group in London, uh, looking at the ecosystem services. And you can see they provide all different types of these four categories of ecosystem services. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all of these today. So I'm just going to focus on these four, their cultural services, pest control, pollination, and decomposition. Um, but this is, I'm happy to talk more about some of these others too in this paper. I'm happy to provide the, the reference for if you're curious. So I'm gonna sort of <laughs> shorten these to four reasons why we should care about wasps. They're cool, they control pests, they pollinate, and they are nature's cleanup crew. So let's start with one, one reason that I think they're super cool. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some work done by researchers that were at the University of Michigan at the time, uh, Michael Sheehan and Elizabeth Tibbetts. Uh, and I'm going to posit, based on their work, that paper wasps are the original facial recognition software. Uh, they have done a lot of work looking at the evolution of facial recognition in wasps. And in this study in particular, um, they were curious about which types of wasps can recognize faces and why that may be valuable. And so what they did is they set up an experiment testing pattern recognition in two different species of paper wasps that are pretty closely related, except that one, uh, Polistes fuscatus, is a social wasp. So it lives in a colony with other members of the same species and uh, multiple queens oftentimes. And then Polistes metricus, which is a solitary paper wasp that doesn't live in colonies with other, or in a colony with other wasps. Um, and they were curious whether they had differences in their ability to recognize wasp faces. And so, the, and, and as well as the test their ability to recognize other types of patterns. So just these sort of basic black and white graphic patterns and then different coloration patterns on caterpillars. And what they did was they um, set up this uh, sort of maze, I guess you could call it, where the floor was uh, electrified so that it was always giving the wasps a little bit of a shock enough that they could feel it, but not so much that they couldn't move, except for in one region that had the image that they wanted the wasp to go to. Um, so if they were training the wasp, they like they wanted it to go to this specific face. They had that face on one side and a different face on the other side. And then they repeated this with those two, like two different graphic patterns and two different caterpillars. And then ran a series of trials to basically train the wasps to learn to go toward the chamber that had the, uh, the, the, the image that was associated with no shock, basically. Um, and 
Here we have a graph, so trial number, which you can think of as like time on the x-axis, and then the number of correct selections. So when they went toward the correct image that they were training the wasp to see. And for the social wasp, right out of the gate, they were more likely, they were, they were likely to go to the, um, the correct face, and that only improved uh, over time, after, over multiple trials. They were also able to learn to recognize the correct graphic pattern and the correct caterpillar over multiple trials. So there clearly is, is learning happening. The proportion of correct is increasing with trial. However, for the other wasp, here the red line is the wasp faces, and then the blue and green lines are the patterns and the caterpillars. They were never able to learn to recognize faces of their own species. They were able to learn a little bit how to recognize the caterpillars and the patterns. Um, and they posit that there's an ecological explanation for this, right? The social wasp, it's really useful if you're living in a colony with a bunch of others to be able to recognize uh, members of your own family, basically, to have a smooth living situation, avoid getting into conflict with other uh, queens, perhaps, of a, a, a colony that's sharing the space with you. Whereas for the solitary wasp, there's not really an evolutionarily good reason to be able to recognize the face of other species, other members of your species. Um, so the other thing about this is in these wasps, right, they're able to recognize the faces faster and better than any other type of pattern, which is also something that humans are able to do. The way that we learn each other's faces is really different than the way that we do other types of pattern recognition. And so it's showing this really remarkable convergent evolution where we're so evolutionarily distant from wasps, and yet we both have this ability to do facial recognition in a way um, that is unique, and it's because we're social species. Um, so really cool study system just showing how impressive wasps are. Um, that's one reason they're cool. Next, we'll get into a little bit more practical reasoning. Um, and I'm going to talk about pest control, which is something that I've alluded to already. Um, so a lot of these wasps, right, are carnivores. They're eating other insects. And many of the times those insects are predator or are, are pests. So they're eating the stuff that we want to eat ourselves. Um, the sort of most famous group of the pest controlling wasps are the parasitoid wasps. So these are those stingless wasps that lay their eggs inside of another organism. Here I'm showing you a diagram with an aphid. And so they're actually sticking their ovipositor into the aphid, laying the egg inside while the aphid is still alive. The eggs will hatch, the larvae will eat the aphid from the inside out while it's still alive until it is uh, just a shell, uh, which we call a mummy. Uh, and then the adult wasps will actually emerge out of a hole that it chews in the aphid uh, to go find another wasp to reproduce with and start the cycle over again. Parasitoids were inspiration for the classic uh, alien film. So this is how aphid, this is how the aliens reproduce um, in, in that film, and which was inspired directly from this real thing that happens in nature right here on planet Earth. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in one really exciting, I think, and really cool example. There are some sort of graphic images of dead insects ahead, so just a, a fair warning. Um, we're going to start this story with this which is not a wasp, it is a caterpillar, Pyrus brassicae. It's a, it forms a large white butterfly, um, which you probably see flying around during the summer. It is a pest of broccoli and cabbage and other cruciferous vegetables. So not something we really want around if we're trying to grow those vegetables to eat ourselves. However, um, there is this tiny little black wasp, Cotesia glomerata, which is a parasitoid of the caterpillar. So it will lay its eggs inside of the caterpillar and then chew on it from the inside. And then you get these little wasp maggots, I guess you could say, larvae uh, emerging from the caterpillar. These actually do a really interesting thing where they form this sort of silk uh, webbing around their cocoons. And the caterpillar actually like remains attached to it. And if it doesn't fully die, they actually like manipulate the brain chemistry of the caterpillar so that it stays there and like protects the developing wasp cocoons. Um, so this is the dead caterpillar with the Cotesia glomerata cocoons. However, they do have the protection from that caterpillar, but sometimes uh, another organism can come along, even another wasp. This is called Lascivia nana. It's another little black parasitoid wasps. 
And they actually like to lay their eggs inside the cocoons of the first wasp. Um, and so that's what these Lysibianana parasitoids are doing now. Additional, so this is what we call a hyperparasitoid, right? It's a parasitoid of a parasitoid. Um, and there's a, an image yeah, of it laying, ovipositing into the cocoon. There's another third wasp called Gellis agilis. Um, this is a wingless wasp, actually. So talk about flying ants. This is, it looks really, really close to an ant, but it's actually a wasp. Um, and it also likes to lay its eggs inside of the cocoons of the first wasp. But sometimes when it's doing that, it finds a cocoon that already has a uh, developing larvae of the second wasp, and it lays its egg inside of that larvae. And so we get tertiary parasitism or parasitoid of a parasitoid of a parasitoid. So we have five trophic levels, as we scientists uh, like to call them, interacting. So we have this interaction web that has the caterpillar, which is fed on by a wasp, which is fed on by another wasp, which is sometimes fed on by a third wasp. Um, so these really crazy interactions that are happening uh, in the insect world all the time. Um, and we're just trying to grow broccoli. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, so that's actually, this study um, goes into some of that, like the, the competitive interactions, right, between those hyperparasitoids. Um, and yes, that is true, like the, the first one in sometimes is, is better, but the interesting thing here is, right, this third level one can actually fully develop even when there's already a parasitoid in the cocoon. Correct, yeah. Um, so that is sort of a crazy example, but I also want to point out that <laughs> there's also some really practical implications of these types of interactions um, classically in what's called classical biological control, which is when we get an invasive pest from another part of the world that shows up in our agricultural system, and we don't have any good predators or natural enemies in our existing environment, and so sometimes we want to import uh, parasitoid or a predator from its original location to do that sort of natural pest control for us. And parasitoids are really good for this because they tend to be pretty specialist. So it's fairly unlikely that they're going to cause off-target effects on some other native species and wreak havoc. Um, so they're a good candidate for this classical importation biological control. And we actually have active programs um, currently. You may have heard of this invasive insect pest called spotted wing drosophila. It's a type of uh, fruit fly that has these sort of sharp uh, razor-like uh, ovipositor um, that it can use to get into fruits like raspberries and strawberries. Um, and it's been causing a lot of problems in North America, um, but recently, there was approval of the importation of this parasitoid, uh, Gnaspis brasiliensis, to control the spotted wing Drosophila. And hopefully we will uh, begin to see effective control relatively soon. Uh, I also wanted to give attention to the social stinging wasps. It's not just these little parasitoids that are controlling pests, although the pest control services of the social wasps are vastly understudied in comparison. So another uh, study out of Syrian Sumner's group trying to put some scientific rigor behind uh, this knowledge, and they were looking at uh, crop pest, uh, caterpillar crop pest of corn, and they did this work in Brazil. Um, and they were like, so the pest was the fall army worm, which is a really devastating pest, um, especially in some tropical parts of the world for corn. Um, and this paper wasp, Polistes satan, uh, which is a, a devilish name, I guess, but it's doing um, some good here. And what they did was they grew corn uh, at a field station, and then they set up these uh, cages where they either put wasps' nests in the cage, or they cleared all the insects except for the caterpillars that they were testing out of the cage to make sure that no insect could come and affect what was going on with these developing caterpillars, which are pests of corn. And then you can see here's a, a wasp actually snagging a caterpillar off of a corn plant. 
And they measured a few different things. First, they just wanted to see how the wasps were affecting the caterpillars. And so on the x-axis here, we have wasps excluded and then wasps exposed um, to the caterpillars on the corn. And on the first graph, we have the number of caterpillars. Um, and you can see there's a significant difference where there's more caterpillars on the corn plants where there were no wasps. But also, really importantly, it's not just about whether they're predating. Um, having a wasp flying around you or if you're a caterpillar can be really scary. And so you might not be able to eat as much because you're scared and you're like afraid. You might have to drop off the plant and scurry away at any moment if this wasp is going to come down and eat you. So they also measured how well the caterpillars developed uh, on the corn with or without the wasps. And they found this really huge difference between the weight of the caterpillars um, when the wasps were present or not. So the wasps are scaring the caterpillars and they're not eating as much, which is good if you're the farmer that's trying to grow corn. They also me uh, measured the damage on the corn um, and also found a difference where uh, the, the damage rating on the corn leaves was much significantly less um, when wasps were present. So these wasps are doing like economically relevant levels of pest control for these farmers. And so it's valuable to have them around. Okay. I'm going to briefly run through pollination. Um, wasps are pollinators, not as good as bees, but these are all pictures of wasps that are using flowers, right? They, they need uh, prey to feed their young for protein, but they got to fuel their flights for their hunting journeys. And so they drink nectar from flowers. That's their sugar source, their carbohydrate source. And so they will incidentally pick up pollen while they're doing this um, and spread it around to flowers. Um, some orchids actually have specialist wasp pollinators and the orchids have co-evolved with these wasps to mimic female wasps that attract males to try to mate with them. Uh, which they're obviously not successful at mating, but they are successful at spreading the orchid pollen around and pollinating the orchid. Um, Non-bees, including wasps, also contribute to crop pollination. So this is some data from a study that reviewed hundreds of studies from all over the world on all different types of crops at um, which insects were visiting crop flowers. And they found that non-bee insects are important pollinators and they actually complete almost half of crop visits to flowers. And while they're not as effective at per visit as bees, they're visiting so often that they actually are important for the, the contribution. And here's just two groups of wasps. Um, wasps visit about 20% of the crops included in this study of 105 crop species. Wasps are known, I think, for their pollination of figs too. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I want to have time for questions. But um, basically, these wasps are tiny, tiny little wasps. They crawl in a little hole in the fig. The flowers are actually inside of this, and they move around trying to find a place to lay eggs and pollinate while they're doing that. Um, they lay their eggs, um, and they develop in these galls inside of the fig fruit. The males emerge first and do more pollination on their way out in search of a mate. And then the females will also come out and chew their way out. Um, and that's how figs get pollinated. Commercial fig production doesn't always rely on pollination um, to like, get you figs, but to like breed figs, we do need pollination. Um, and so this is an important contribution and only wasps can do this. Okay, last quick one I wanna talk about is nature's cleanup crew. Uh, Here's um, a wasp on a rotten fruit. Um, think about all the stuff that dies all the time, like fruits that fall, animals that die. I actually have another image, uh, this uh, another sort of a warning that we have a, a gruesome dead animal image coming up. Uh, but here is a, a bird and look at all these wasps swarming around. If we didn't have insects and other organisms to come around and scavenge, we'd be living in a world full of carcasses, um, which wouldn't be great. So these are sort of the first responders, I like to say, in nature's cleanup crew. They get things ready for the bacteria and the fungi and other stuff that's going to help decompose this fully, um, which is a very important ecosystem service. However, this is from that review paper. I want to highlight this sentence, the first sentence of the section on decomposition and nutrient cycling. The role of wasps in decomposition and nutrient cycling is almost entirely unstudied. 
So this is like a huge gap in our scientific knowledge about what wasps are contributing to our world and making it a, a more pleasant place to be for all of us. And so I think this is an area that's really ripe for research. We don't we know anecdotally from seeing these wasps out in the world that they're doing this, but we don't have really good quantification of like how much, which ones, when is it important. Um, so important that we get more funding. Okay, in the last few minutes, I wanna talk about how we can protect wasps, because I hope by now I've convinced you that they are worthy of our protection. Um, and you may have heard about declines in pollinators or like the insect apocalypse. There's all of these sort of warnings that things are not looking great. We, we are lacking data in a lot of cases, and I think it's perhaps a little early to make predictions like we're going to see the extinction of all insect species in the next 100 years, which is something I have seen. That's not going to happen. Um, but we do uh, know that things aren't looking good and we don't even know in many cases which species are most at risk because they're not well documented. Um, but people are growing uh, in their awareness of this and trying to do things. I was delighted to see this last year uh, in the New York Times, why you should plant a garden that's wasp friendly um, that covered a lot of the same things I'm talking about here. Um, and this is uh, contributions from uh, this woman, Heather Holm, who's written this book, a guide for the wasps of Eastern North America. Um, and she's also done a lot of work on like pollinator and bee conservation too. So I recommend checking out her stuff. Um, she's a really great advocate for this type of stuff. Um, so I wanna talk about what I see as the major things wasps need to thrive, food, shelter, and a non-toxic habitat in order to live their lives. Talk about food first. So as I've mentioned, wasps need prey for protein and nectar for carbohydrates. Prey is not something we're probably going to be directly manipulating most of the time. In fact, if that's the service that we want to be getting from wasps in some cases, eating pests, we probably don't want to like intentionally introduce more pests. Um, but we also can grow maybe some non-crop areas that could also be home for other insects like aphids or something that could then be food for wasps. But we, we do have more control over directly is nectar. Um, and this is uh, a few things to think about. And I think these guidelines also apply if you're trying to do pollinator or bee conservation too. We wanna think about which types of flowers we're planting and what they're providing. So one thing to take into consideration is that different types of flowers have different nutrient compositions. And this is sort of just on the cutting edge of science. We just are figuring out which nutrients are most important, which flowers have them, are bees selectively choosing them. But we do know for now that it's probably good to have a diverse buffet of nutrients. And we can do that by having a diverse collection of flowers. We also know that different flowers bloom at different times of the year. And so if we wanna conserve all of the species that may be flying around from spring to fall, um, we're gonna want flowers that are blooming over that entire period. Here is uh, just a sampling of some species that can cover the early, middle, and late part of the growing season here in Wisconsin. These are all native species. I would always recommend if you're gardening for pollinators, choosing native plants that are co-evolved with the wild native pollinators because those are the ones that need help. And these are going to be some of their favorite foods because they're the foods that they've known for thousands and thousands of years. Next, I want to talk about shelter. Um, a lot of the wasps, like I've said, uh, actually are not making the iconic wasps nests that you think about. They may be nesting in holes in twigs or making these little pots. And so I think an important consideration here is just leaving that sort of debris around. Don't mow, um, don't get rid of all of your uh, dead stems in the fall and winter because that could be important places where the wasps are keeping warm um, and spending their time over the winter. I also think it's important to think about the wasps that are doing this <laughs> for shelter. I'm not gonna tell you that this is totally fine and you should just leave it. We have to coexist and live with these species. And it can be annoying uh, and scary to have a bunch of buzzing wasps in your backyard if you're trying to have a dinner party or a gathering. Um, and so I don't think we should just put up with any wasp nest wherever it is. I would recommend, however, 
that you're proactive about it um, and plug up cracks and holes and be vigilant in places where you know you don't want a wasp to make a home. And also monitor for early occurrence. If you start to see a wasp building a nest, get rid of it early. It's much easier and better for the wasps to do it then than if you don't discover it until there's hundreds or thousands of them. Um, and then there's really not much alternative besides using chemicals to uh, eliminate it. And as I'm about to talk about, we want to try to keep the chemicals in the environment to a minimum. So non-toxic habitat is really important for these species. Um, pesticides can have impacts because they're sprayed directly on the flowers, which the wasps may then be visiting for their food. But also we have systemic insecticides, right, that are applied and then taken up actually in the tissues of the plant. Um, and then can get into the pollen and nectar and insects that are eating the plant that way. Um, so it's important to be mindful of both of those. In particular, there's a lot of concern right now, I think, around neonicotinoids or neonics, um, which are like a relatively new class of insecticide that there's a lot of concern with their effects on wildlife and pollinators. We do know that they can have direct mortality at high concentrations and at lower non-lethal concentrations. They can have negative effects on the growth, development, navigation, and other behaviors of bees. However, the safe thresholds for these are largely unknown for most species. Almost all of the laboratory studies have been done on honeybees and a few types of like bumblebees. To my knowledge, there hasn't been any good quantification of this for most bee species, let alone wasps, which as we've said, get much less attention than bees. And so I think it's important to be cautious um, and try to keep use of these chemicals to a minimum. Okay. I want to take it back to the study that I opened this talk with about why we love bees and hate wasps. Um, at the conclusion of this, the authors are like, okay, so what do we do about this? Um, they propose that what's happening is there's this sort of vicious feedback loop where not only do, does the public not like wasps, but scientists don't really like wasps that much either. There's a growing divide in research on bees versus wasps. So in these graphs, we've got time on the x-axis and then the amount of scientific output uh, about bees versus wasps, bees in red, wasps in blue. And you can see that starting in the 1980s, there's like similar publication levels of papers, scientific papers about bees and wasps, but that we see this growing divide where we're seeing way more publications about bees and not as many about wasps. Um, and same thing is happening with uh, abstracts from scientific conferences. If anything, we're actually seeing a decline in the number of uh, research projects that are presented about at conferences on wasps. And so they propose this, this feedback loop that's happening where the public, the wasps are unpopular uh, with the public because they don't under, appreciate the various ecosystem services that wasps have, which makes it less popular for scientists to study them, harder to get funding to study them because they're not seen as an issue of public importance, which means there's less research that happens, which means we don't know about the ecosystem services that wasps are providing. And if we don't know, then the public can't be aware. And so they're even also not going to care. They suggest that we need to boost the public image of wasps through outreach um, and research uh, on the ecosystem service value of these creatures. Um, and that hopefully that can help reverse this trend where scientists and the public will continue to appreciate the various things that these organisms do for us um, and improve our ability to conserve them. And I hope I have uh, made a small contribution to that today. Um, and with that, I'll stop and happy to take any questions you have. If the folks can hear at home, I'm gonna bring the microphone to you if you have a question. Darius. What proportion of the um, agricultural pest control market is actually financially made up of production of ecumenoid or other pest control wasps for use in agriculture? So you mean like rearing wasps to release in rearing agriculture? Wasps to release, selling wasps yeah. to. Yeah, very, very, very small. Um, wasps in particular, it's more common to see like ladybugs or lacewings, I think, are the ones that I see commercially available. I will say in most like production agriculture that happens outdoors, it's not very useful to buy 
organisms to bring them in because they'll just fly away. Um, it is very useful in like a greenhouse setting um, where it's more common. Um, but I think the more valuable route here is uh, what I would call habitat management or conservation biological control, we call it, which is like making an agricultural environment that is hospitable to the beneficial species so that the naturally occurring populations can build up and be there when we want them and need them to do pest control. So that's actually a lot of what my own research is about. And I'm studying um, lady beetles and uh, some other predators too, but I would be really excited to do that for wasps because I don't think for most of the wasp species, uh, well, we don't know which ones are most important, like in which crops and things like that. And then we also don't know like what we need to do to manage the habitat to keep them around. So hopefully we can get more, more scientific work on that. Real quick one. What's the difference between a parasitoid and a parasite? Why yeah. do entomologists talk about parasitoids? Very good question. So a parasite doesn't necessarily kill the host. Um, so you can think of like, you have a tapeworm or something like that. Um, it, it has a negative health consequence usually, but it uh, doesn't necessarily kill the host. A parasitoid by definition uh, kills the host. It fe like feeds on the host to the point of death. And in insects, uh, we usually think about parasitoids as laying their eggs inside of a living host. Yeah. Do murder wasps kill humans? <laughs> Do murder wasps kill humans? Um, they, I'm not going to say that there's never been a documented case, but it's very, 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 very rare. Um, so yeah, I think a couple things to that. So in their native range, they're which is like in um, Northern Asia, they're like, well, can, they're just part of the ecosystem, right? Like they're just like any other wasp. They're usually not in numbers that are gonna wreak havoc. Um, we've pretty much eradicated them from the United States to our knowledge. We'll see this year if we find any um, more, but like I said, in 2022, there were no sightings of the murder hornets. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, it's general policy. Like people say this all the time, but it's really true. Like if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. They don't want to hurt you. They only do it when they're scared and feel like their life is threatened. So. Um, I have a question. Yeah. About, um, what would you, how would you convince, like, I guess the general public um, about like convincing wasps? Because I know you showed the graphic about like, uh, oh, we need to like treat wasps and how we treat bees, but like, how would you go about doing it? Well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping this can help a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, talking about them, like highlighting the good things. I think also, drawing attention, there, there seems like people recognize that bees can sting, but I feel like, especially recently with the like pollinator declines, like there's been this massive public awareness about like the value of pollinators and pollination, which I think has been really wonderful. And in many ways is helpful for the cause of insect conservation generally. But I think like continuing to draw attention to, it's not just pollination that insects do. There's all these other services that they provide. And why does that not never come into the conversation when we are like, oh, but they sting? Um, like I don't. It, it seems to be possible. Like it's happened for bees, um, and I think it's possible to be cautious and reverent and um, know, like know to keep our distance while also appreciating um, the beauty and the utility that the different groups have. So I think yeah, just like talking about it, telling people some of the stuff that I told you today. How did the wasp actually subdue their prey? What's the process? Um, yeah, so they kind of have to be able to sneak up at them to get access, but then they'll in, uh, inject them with venom, um, which paralyzes them. Um, so if you can get, if it can get a clean shot as soon as the stinger goes in. So can... what's at the end of an ovipositor that it's almost like the an elephant's trunk, you've got something that can see in the dark, drill through bark, <laughs> find an egg, identify it, lay an egg. I think the way the ovipositor works, so if it's drilling through bark, they're looking for the holes on the, the bark. Um, and presumably if there's, they're, they're looking, and I guess we don't fully know for every species how they do this, but there may also be chemical cues, right? But they look for the hole that the parent of the host drilled and then stick their ovipositor into that hole. 
So they're probing for an existing hole, not drilling one. I didn't Usually I, they can drill through wood. Um, like, I don't know if they like maybe need to, once they're in there, like there's a, it's not fully a clear path or something, but usually they're, I think, looking for existing holes um, or at least some sort of sign that they know that there's an egg there. They're not just probing randomly. But it, is like, larvae. it would be the equivalent of an antenna coming out the tail though, that it's got chemoreceptors or whatever. So, um, I don't know if the ovipositor itself has chemoreceptors. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Hole in the ground that the wasps lived in last year. Mm -hmm. Will they come back to that spot next year or will they find another spot? Um, they might. I mean, they probably overwintered there. Um, because yeah, if they're like a ground nesting social species, they're probably overwintering um some as adults. So yeah, I think it probably will have wasps unless the colony died for some reason. Yeah. Okay, wait a second, Larry. Tom, let's get away. <laughs> so the people at home can hear. Now the the the, uh, the when the uh, uh, stinger got developed for the for the wasps, mm -hmm. the stinging wasps, how did the uh, how did what changed so that they still could produce eggs since that piece yeah, was it's like a, evolved that way? Um, I don't know the exact process, but my understanding is they still, so they still lay eggs, obviously. They just don't go through that long tube. It's a separate sort of organ, sort of at the base of the abdomen for most species. I think there are a couple exceptions to this. There are a couple that actually can both lay eggs and um, eject venom through their ovipositor slash stinger, but that's not the most common strategy. It's like evolved a different, a different organ to do that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm wondering, do you said there's such a diversity of wasp species around the world? Are any wasps eaten or edible by humans? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I wouldn't be surprised if there is probably a social species where the the larvae maybe are eaten. Um, I don't think the adults would be very tasty. Um, also, they have they may have venom depending on the species, so you probably don't want to eat those. Um, and then the adults are like going to be mostly like chitin and like crunchy. Um, but yeah, perhaps I know people eat like ant larvae, right? Um, so that's a good question. I'll, I'll look it up, but I don't know off the top of my head. And I have one other question too. If if folks are out on a hike or in their garden or just you know anywhere else you might see a wasp and they want to figure out what kind of wasp it is or understand what sort of species they, they have in the, mm -hmm. the world around them, what sort of resources would you point people to? Um, sorry, can you repeat that one more time? I was trying to pull up the slide. Of course. Um, if, uh, if folks are interested in learning more about the wasps that you can find around here in Madison or yes. that they might see in their gardens, yeah. Uh, how would you reckon people look and totally. what resources? So a few resources. So for like in the field identification, um, this is, I'm not going to endorse this as like <laughs> a gold standard that everyone should do, but there are some apps, some phone apps that use AI to help you identify organisms. And if you can get a good image of like a, a stable image, they're quite helpful and often fairly accurate. Like I'm impressed how accurate they are sometimes. Um, so like Seek by iNaturalist is one, or even the iNaturalist app itself is probably, uh, it won't give you as an immediate an, an answer maybe, but that gets validated by others. Um, so iNaturalist is a great like first looking in the field sort of op option. Um, I really like bugguide.net. Um, they have an incredible catalog of all of the insects of North America with tons of photos, natural history information, um, scientific publications about that species. Um, and it's, I use, yeah, I honestly used it a lot in for this, this presentation to like get some images and um, some nat like the natural history information about a lot of the species that I talked about. So those would be my uh, main two. I would also recommend um, Heather Holmes book that I pulled up here. 
um, the Wasps of North America book. And that's not showing on the screen anymore. Yeah, I'll okay. pull it up. I took it out of presenter view. Here we go. So yeah, this book, Wasps, A Guide for Eastern North America by Heather Holm. Yeah, so those are my three. I Naturalist, Bug Guide, Wasps of Eastern North America. I'm a little, I'm a little curious about the zombie chemicals that take over the brains. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that some wasps have, yeah. Um, I don't know a ton about this. Um, I'm happy to share. I, I can, I know of a couple articles, but um, basically to my understanding, scientists have found that there's like hormonal changes that happen in the bodies of some of the hosts of parasitoids when they lay their eggs in them or when, when a wasp lays its eggs in them, that they will, they will not do their normal behaviors and instead uh, their behavior switches to like protecting the developing wasps, either by, uh, so that they became like pretty sedentary, but then also like even when the wasps have emerged, they'll remain in the area um, to like, serve as a protector basically is how it's described. Um, I don't know exactly like what the chemicals are or like how that's happening biophysically, but um, I can look into it and follow up with, with Will or if you want to share your contact info. Do murder wasps and killer bees have similarities and where do we stand with killer bees coming into to our areas? So killer bees, I imagine you're probably talking about like Africanized honeybees. I would guess, um, which, yeah, so those are uh, high, basically like a hybrid type of honeybee. So honeybees are not native to North America, right? Honeybees are from Europe. Um, the ones that we have in North America, we think actually came from Italy originally, but there's other types of honeybees in uh, Asia and Africa. Um, and there's this particular type of hybridized European honeybee that's it's called Africanized because they're um, hybridized with a species from Africa that are like more aggressive um, than our domesticated honeybees. Um, I don't think they, that, so to my knowledge, they're like not, they're nowhere near Wisconsin. I'd be skeptical that they could survive in the climate. Uh, I also think it's a killer is probably a bit of a, a misnomer. I don't think they're like actually killing that many people. I mean, if you get swarmed by a lot of them, like that, that's bad, but um, yeah. So I guess in terms of behavior, perhaps they're both so named murder or killer because of their aggression, which is uh, uncharacteristic compared to most other bees or wasps. Um, but biologically, like they're, pro they're no more closely related than any like pair of bees or wasps probably. Any other questions? Uh, if not, thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me.